We're standing at one of the most beautiful vistas overlooking Jerusalem. We can see here the way the whole city is spread out in front of us. It's a magnificent view for tourists, but at one point it was a view for the Jordanian army when they were sighting their artillery on the main parts of the city. And if you look carefully, you can see in front of us the Knesset, you can see the Israel Museum, you can see all the way to Mount Scopus and to the Mount of Olives, and we can see this, the neighborhoods of Jews and Arabs who today live together here peacefully, but who were once ripped apart by a city that was divided in half. Once again, there's pressure on Israel to try to divide the city again. And, uh, and that's why we're here today, to try to think about what that would, the implications would be. Jerusalem is the heart and soul of the Jewish people. It's the symbol of our unity. It's the place where David reigned, where the prophets uh, walked. It's the place where the religious revolution that Abraham brought to the world began. It's a city that stayed in our collective memories for thousands of years of exile in a way that no other city has captivated the imagination of no other people in history. It's a symbol of the unity of the Jewish people. It's a symbol of the return of the Jewish people. And we're here today to try to understand not only the emotional connection that we have to, this, to, to Jerusalem, but why it's such an important place strategically. Because without control of Jerusalem, it's almost impossible to control the land of Israel. This is the place where the roads come to the, old, to the uh, Dead Sea, where the road to uh, Tel Aviv and the coast. This is the mountain range that divides the, the whole country, so that the roads north and south here. Anyone who holds on to this area holds on to the land of Israel. Israel annexed Jerusalem two weeks after the uh, conclusion of the Six-Day War. And there were really three reasons. First of all, to unite a city that had cruelly been torn apart. Second of all, to realize a dream of 2,000 years of reestablishing the capital of the Jewish people in Jerusalem as it always had been. And thirdly, to prevent forever a hostile army from ever threatening to capture the city and to take advantage of its location to endanger all of the state of Israel. It's true that uh, today, from the Palestinian Authority, it's possible to shoot missiles into Israel. It's possible to shoot them into Israel from Gaza. But the real danger, much more dangerous than the missiles, is the danger of tens of thousands of assault rifles that have a range where they can kill people up to about five kilometers, and they have an effective range of a few hundred meters. Those assault rifles are already in the hands of Palestinians throughout the Palestinian Authority. And our experience during the Second Intifada was that anywhere where the Palestinians were able to stand on a hill and shoot into Israeli cities, they did. They made life totally miserable for the Israelis who were within their range. And, there's, um, and, to, and to go back to a situation like that is to make Jerusalem an unlivable city. What Jews wanted to do immediately after 1967 is come, come here, because in Judea Samaria was the birthplace, the cradle of Jewish civilization. And as the Jews came here to visit, they streamed to the old city of Jerusalem. They came in huge numbers to see Hebron, to see Bethlehem, to see Shechem, to see all these places that featured so prominently both in our biblical history and in our more modern history. And so the next step really was a natural one. People said, not enough to visit, we want to settle. This land is empty. This land is opened up before us with so many empty hilltops beckoning for Jews to come home and to settle. So Jews did not uh, uh, come out of any need that was economic. Jews were not transferred to this area. Jews came willingly and enthusiastically of their own accord. And in fact, the settlement movement at its very heart was a grassroots movement. It began with young people in response to the miracle of the 67 war coming here and petitioning the government, allow us to please reestablish our ancestral homeland and build new modern communities here in Judea and Samaria. There's no such thing as East and West Jerusalem, right? The term is used to mean 
East Jerusalem is what the Jordanians controlled, and West Jerusalem is what the Israelis controlled. And it sounds like it's a very neat type of thing. You draw a line, and that's the end of it. The truth is, we're now standing in Gilo, which is the south of Jerusalem. This was under Jordanian control. Today, it's a neighborhood with 40 or 50,000 Jews. Right below us is Beit Safafa, which is a beautiful Arab neighborhood that's connected to Gilo, and the communities live together. On the other side of that is the industrial area of Talpiot, down to the left is another Arab neighborhood. The communities live together in a, in a tapestry where they're totally intertwined. They live together in peace. But the image that the uh, international uh, press, by, by and large, tries to create is, oh, all you have to do is pull these two pieces apart and put them back together again, everything will be fine. Uh, there are factories here, there are farms here, and every single one of these new economic ventures meant providing employment, not only for Jews, but for Arabs as well. In addition, from the very beginning, uh, Israel opened up colleges here in Judea and Samaria for Arabs. So today, the economic situation of Arabs, and this goes back to 1967 and continues until today, the economic situation today for Arabs here in Judea and Samaria is so much better than it was before 1967. Frankly, had the Arabs never launched its various terrorism wars, the Palestinian uh, areas, the uh, Arab communities here, would be even better situation than they are today. Uh, where there was a real stall, was a real halt in economic cooperation and economic development for the Palestinians was during those years where the Palestinians, rather than I investing themselves and their resources in developing the area and developing their own economic infrastructure, instead there were years where they uh, put all their resources uh, into destroying Israel. And uh, that's really quite unfortunate. But other than those times, we have seen that the Jewish presence here, it's providing enormous jobs. And, and I'll say one more thing. A couple of years ago, the Palestinian Authority uh, tried to initiate a boycott whereby all Arabs working for Jewish communities would just, on a, on a particular day, quit their jobs and stop working. One after the other, the Arabs said to the Palestinian Authority, the Jews are giving us jobs. You have given us nothing. And the boycott fizzled out before it ever got started. I think the real threat is not really the armaments or even the record that the Palestinians have of using it. The real threat is political. The total lack of reliability of international guarantees in the face of Arab political pressure. Those calling on Israel to divide its own capital are, are willing to guarantee Israel's security in the future but will they do that if Palestinians violate the terms of an agreement? How likely is it that they would really follow through with that?